How many of you were registered in my class? Raise your hand. Oh, you're all, okay. Oh, here's some more. Those students coming in, I'd appreciate it if you'd come down lower here. Come down here to the first row. And fill in those, the seats in the last row here. Come down, please. We're ready to start. Right here. If you move, okay. Keep your things under your seats so people can pass by. Very good, that looks much prettier, okay. Now, I'm sure we'll have a few more people. Uh, I want to say good afternoon, it's a beautiful Monday, perfect. After the horror of yesterday and Saturday, we're grateful, aren't we? Um, I'm going to uh, make an announcement about the uh, field trips, the one that Theory generously uh, gave us, okay? And uh, I want to tell you that tomorrow is the first trip, and I spoke to Mr. Andrew Rosen. He, spe he has uh, arranged a special field trip where you'll be having the privilege of touring the design rooms. You'll have a special tour to meet the vice president of creative design, the merchandising team, the sales director, in different areas. You're going to go around the, uh, his exquisite uh, uh, showroom. It's not just a show, it's a show place. And you will have an experience that you won't have anywhere else because it's very special and I'm surprised that for tomorrow's program, I only have five students who signed up. And if after the, if you haven't signed up, please come, I've brought down the uh, list and the students uh, uh, of tomorrow's trip, have, have you all picked up your uh, directions, where to go? Have you? Okay, I see that. Now the students who haven't picked up their instructions are Simone Nepomyshka, Sorana Vansia, Isabel Dimitriakis, Brian Judd, Lauren Cripps, Harriet Ball, Charlotte Gray, Hai Jung Oh. That's for Thursday the 22nd. Uh, uh, Vera and Emma and Julia have picked up their uh, tickets, okay? Now those of you who haven't, I've made, to make life easy, I've brought down the directions, so after the lecture you come up here and you sign in and I'll give it to you. How many of you are going on the 20th? Raise your hands. All right, come up. If you haven't picked up your directions, now is the time, okay? And uh, it's a very special tour and I'm shocked. On Thursday I have 11 signed up so he expects 15 for each field trip. So we need 10 more for tomorrow and four more for uh, Thursday. So please come up and see me afterwards if you still want to uh, sign up. This will be a rare experience and privilege. We're very lucky to have that. And he also has a big international team and that's important for you because theory is in Japan in uh, uh, Asia all over and, and all over Europe and uh, it's extraordinary and it, he's very kind to give us that opportunity to learn okay and uh, that's the field trip tomorrow at 530 and Thursday at 530 with uh, instructions are with me if you haven't picked them up now today you have another privilege of meeting someone visionary, imaginative, and right on target when it comes to merchandising and marketing. He, uh, as you know, if you've read, he's a hundred years ago, his brother Michael and uh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas, their great-grandmother, 
Mrs. Lena Bryant founded the department store Lane Bryant. How many of you know the name Lane Bryant? Raise your hands. Thank God. Okay. Uh, and uh, she said, never ask a woman to conform their figure to fashion. Our guests today said they were inspired by her. And to continue the family tradition, FTF, they established plus size fashions. Michael's love is jazz. That's his brother. And uh, no, it's you. You love jazz. I do too. Crazy about it and uh, saxophone, and Nicholas, his uh, brother, is a buyer, has been a buyer at sax? He was, yes. Well, he'll tell you more about it. I don't want to take away from his precious time, but uh, I'm going to ask Michael, and oh, the fashion to figure, FTF stands, because uh, there's, the statistics show there are young women in the United States that are a little on the heavy side, and, but there was no fashion for them. Lane Bryant was mostly for the Missy figure. And that's what gave uh, Michael and his brother the idea to s establish fashion to figure making uh, uh, with it chic, sexy clothes for y uh, women who had a uh, who young women who ha had a little too much weight, okay? Is that right? Almost. You'll, you'll fix it. You'll fix You'll straighten me out. I want you to come up here and take this away from me. Okay. okay. You're wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you. Dear. What a great introduction. <laughs> yeah. So... So that's me and that's our store that Alice was talking about. Um, we, when I finished graduate school, I started this chain, which um, is exclusively focused on women that wear above size 12. The concept was that there's really not contemporary, trendy, multiple choice stores for women that wear above size 12. Traditionally, they've always been asked to shop one brand at a time in environments that really ring out front that it's an exceptional large size store. Our store is a fashionable store by anyone's definition. Fashion is the common denominator. It's trendy and contemporary looking by anyone's um, definition. Yeah, I can. Is that, is that better? Um, it's trendy and contemporary by anyone's definition. We just happen to start at size 12. So at any of our stores on any given day, you'll see women that are size two, four, six in the stores, only realizing after the fact that we actually start at size 12. And that's a great statement to make to our customer, who traditionally has been segregated from the fashion world and been treated really like an afterthought, and as, as somebody that only had a very few stores to go to, none of which were fashionable. So, I guess you're saying with my, or you're at, you might ask, like with my background of having gone to business school, why am I, why did I go into retail, why did I go into fashion, and you know, why am I here talking to you? Um, I guess the, the, the one um, common thing between us is that I was also, I, having gone to business school and you being in design school, we were, it, we're each in programs that are very, very deeply focused, narrowly focused on a specific um, skill set and not, or, or trying to lead to something very, very specific. And so I, upon, or, or considering my graduation, like I'm sure many of you are considering kind of what to do next, uh, when I was in your position in my program, I, I felt very strongly that I wanted to create my own idea. I had this idea while I was going to school in your position, and I wanted to start my own, or I wanted to take a concept or a, a thought process, an idea that I had, and I wanted to try to make a company out of it to create my own opportunity for after school. And that's kind of what I thought I'd talk to you about today, because I'm sure many of you are, are considering your own concepts, businesses, or ideas that you've been working on or, or have worked on through school. And having been in a similar position to you, I want to take you through what I went through, the thought process I went through that led me to actually successfully launch our concept, which you might think about with regard to some of the ideas that you're talking about. I think when you um, specifically think about the retail and fashion industry, it really is all the startup concepts, either on the design side or the retail side, where all the attention is being given, all the money is being 
given all the acknowledgement. The, the exciting stuff in the industry is coming from people like, you know, the Zach Posens on the design side or the Calypsos or Intermix on the retail side, people that are starting new concepts and not thinking about things in a traditional way. So I would really strongly encourage any of you who are thinking about any idea or a concept in, in your program um, to, to try to take that somewhere and see where it goes. And that's what I, I'm going to discuss today is kind of what I went through in business school um, about a, a thought process I went through about how to take a concept to, to make it reality. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first thing that's really important when considering any concept is to, is to see if there's a big market there. Uh, if you have a, a, an idea or if you have a passion for something, it's important to put it in, in or to, it's important to understand whether or not that's related to a mass market where a lot of money is being spent, a lot of people are transacting around that, and a lot of uh, activity is happening. So, for example, in our case, I, I had this idea uh, for, for a, a, a plus-size women's retailer, and the relevant thing for me to figure out was, are there lots of customers, is there lots of money being spent on this industry, and is there a, is there a lot happening such that there's room for another idea? And in our case, yeah, I mean, we found that there's 60 million women in America that wear above size 12. There's $30 billion spent each year on plus-size apparel alone in the U.S. And so clearly, when I came up with my idea, it was, it, I found that the market opportunity was pretty big. So I would encourage you around whatever concept you're thinking about to understand whether it's in a mass market or not. I mean, as an example, if somebody had an, an idea and a passion for, you know, nuclear atom splitting machines, there's probably nine of them in the United States. That's not, like a, that's not a big market. So um, it's important to make sure that your idea uh, also represents a pretty significant opportunity. I think once, you, once you've done some research and concluded that there is a big opportunity there, um, try to find some inconsistency in the market or try to find a problem. Try to find something that's not right that you want to fix. Usually, if there's an opportunity, it's, it revolves around something that's not working, something that, that customers are not happy with or that consumers are not satisfied with. And really, the opportunities are around solving those problems for people. Uh, in our case, so Palisade Center Mall is the biggest mall in New York State. It's where we have our first store. And in our industry, there's, there, well, let me put it like this. If you're a size six woman, you have 50 stores in that mall to go to. And if, you're, if you wear above size 12, you have three stores, and fashion to figure as a new concept is one of them. So, I mean, clearly there's a problem there, right? I mean, if 60 million women comprise this market opportunity, but there's only three stores for them in the biggest mall in New York State, but a size six woman has 50 stores in that mall, clearly that's an inconsistency or a business problem or something that started to make me think that's the, that's the, that's the area in, within this market opportunity that seems inconsistent to me that I want to try to develop an idea around fixing. So the next thing that you need to do after you've determined that there's a market opportunity and some inconsistency that you want to try to attack is to try to find people and experience that you can bring in to help you solve that problem. So in my case, I have a general business background. I, I, I worked around startups before and uh, I worked on the financial side and I had this idea for a retailer looking analytically at the retail market for, for our customer base, but I didn't have the skill set to understand how do you merchandise to this market? Or how do, can you find uh, merchandise for this customer? Or how do you set up a retail store and make it profitable in terms of what, are the co what do the costs need to be? Uh, what, is your, what do your margins need to be? So I went and found experience to, around my concept to help me attack that problem that I found and try, try to formulate more in, in a more crystallized way a concept that would fix the issue that we identified. In my case, my brother had, uh, luckily for me, been in retail operations for 20 years. And he was somebody that I collaborated with when I was just in the idea stage of this business. And he could say to me from real industry experience, what you're thinking is wrong, or what you're thinking is impractical, or the industry doesn't work that way, or stores don't work that way. He was able to take my idea and, and root it in reality because his, his skills and experience were very different than my own. And then we also um, found a former colleague of his that was a fantastic merchant 
uh, to, to, to help us on the inventory management side. But my point here is go try to find somebody to collaborate with around your idea. I mean, if you truly have a concept that's attacking some um, business issue and a mass market opportunity, go get some people that can help you refine that idea and complement your own skills and try to help you refine the concept to make it into, into, a better, into a better reality. We have a board of advisors as well. Um, this is part of trying to find that experience. There are some people that will work with you full time. I mean, many of your fellow students, I think, probably have similar skills to you and, and will work on an idea with you from maybe the same vantage point. There are other people that won't work with you full time. There's people who can or who will collaborate with you in a different way. They'll give you credibility as the outside world looks at you and they'll also criticize you internally to make your concept stronger and bring other levels and layers of experience so that they can, so that your idea can stand up to higher scrutiny. So in our case, you know, as a retailer, you need advice with regard to financing, you need advice with regard to real estate, you need advice with regard to marketing, you need advice with regard to, um, you know, general business management. We got all these people to, on the one hand, give us credibility with the outside world, but on the other hand, very practically get on the phone with me and say, here's what I think you ought to do, or here's how you should temper, change, modify what your thinking is. Um, it's helped quite a bit, and again, being right in a similar position to you guys, the first advisor I got that gave us credibility was a professor of mine from business school. And the school that you're at is obviously filled with professors and mentors and advisors who would, just by their being involved with you and lending their name to your presentation, would give you credibility for whatever you're doing. So you don't have to look very far in a place like this to, to get credibility um, for a retail or fashion concept. So once you, once you go through a lot of those steps in terms of finding an opportunity, a market opportunity, finding an inconsistency, developing uh, a team around attacking that problem, and then getting some other credibility from outside sources, develop a concept. Come up with a concept and crystallize what you're trying to do. In our case, we want to be a contemporary fast fashion retailer for, for large sizes. We want to be very, very trendy, multi-brand offering uh, at fast fashion prices in a contemporary environment with high levels of service for women that wear above size 12. You know, that was our specific crystallized answer to the problem that we saw in our market. The, the last thing to do uh, after you've gotten through all these phases is to make sure that what you want to do, this, that, that once you've found this opportunity, the people, the credibility, and you've crystallized the concept, make sure from the industry that you've chosen that you actually can go do it. So what I originally thought about when I started our business was it seems strange to me that women above size 12 were being asked to shop one brand at a time. So I wanted to create a boutique that had tons of different brands and tons of different choices for a customer that didn't have choices. It made sense academically. It makes sense on paper. It's another thing if there are actually tons of different brands to go buy. You know, I mean, it, it, it was a theoretical argument that I actually had to go out to the industry and, and say, well, I, I know that it seems rational that women above size 12 should have tons of brands inside one store, but are there tons of brands out there? Are there tons of vendors making product in, uh, in this size spec that we can actually source? So it's, it's one thing to say you want to do something or it's one thing to academically formulate an argument to do something. It's another thing to go out and find if it can actually be done. In our case, in our case we found that um, since 1983, the number of people making large size product in the continental US alone has gone up from 100 to 2,000. So the idea of trying to get lots of different brands and lots of different product and put it inside one box was very viable because in the 20 years that we, since, since we sort of looked at this in the past, the number of people making product had multiplied by 10x. So whatever it is that you want to do, make sure from the industry standpoint or from what goes on in the, in the market that you're looking at that what you want to do can actually be done. And then, I guess one thing that's always important in, in business or anything that you're doing is definitely have your spin on it. I mean, be unique. I think the big, the big thing here is that if you truly have a good idea 
And, and if it is a great market opportunity and you get people involved with you to, to go after it and it becomes a, a, a living, breathing thing and it's a good idea, it's going to get copied. Any good idea begs replication. I mean, in the five years since we've been in business, there's other plus size companies now that have very trendy contemporary product and, and lots of different brands in one store. I mean, any good idea begs replication. The question is, if you're competing against other companies that do what you do, what makes you different? And in our case, we believe our levels of customer service and the, the experience that customers have in our store, we feel like is, is not able to be equaled anywhere else. We feel as though our passion for what we do and the, and the people that do it at, at, the, at our store level will, ne will not be equaled anywhere. So that's our unique spin on, on what we do. But just remember that any concept you're considering uh, if it's a good one, chances are somebody else also had the idea, and you need to have your unique spin on it. Now, what Alice alluded to before, in terms of my family's background, is part of what drives our passion for what we do. Um, my great-grandmother was Lane Bryant. Her, actually, her name was Lena Bryant, and um, she, she had a great American, you know, live the American dream story of somebody that immigrated to this country in the late 19th century um, and through circumstance went into the dressmaking business and invented the maternity dress. Um, that adds a lot to what we feel we bring to what we're doing. I mean, we, when, when your family is responsible for founding an industry, clearly you feel that your pa level of passion for that industry is going to be higher than somebody else doing it. Um, her story resonates with a lot of people that work with us and a lot of people that shop with us. Um, basically, she was, she immigrated in the 1870s and, or 1880s and, and was having a, a typical, I suppose, immigrant experience at the time until her husband dropped dead very unexpectedly and left her with a one-year-old child and without any means to support the child or herself. And she pawned a pair of earrings for a Singer sewing machine with no other option and started sewing out of her house, making dresses for people in the neighborhood. It got to be a pretty um, sustainable business. People in the neighborhood knew her, started to know her reputation and came to her regularly. And a woman came to her, I guess, in the mid-1890s and said, I really love your stuff. I really love getting the dresses in the neighborhood with you, but I'm going to be pregnant, and I don't know what to do. If I pay you extra, can you figure out some design that will... will that I can deal with or that will f accommodate my pregnancy. And she said, well, I, I really have never considered anything like this before. I don't know what to do, but I'll try something. And she went away and invested the extra money she was given in, an, in an, a piece of elastic that she put in the waist of the dress. And that dress design is actually the thing in the middle there. I thought this kind of stuff would be interesting to, to design students that um, that dress, she basically put this elastic waistband in so that the dress would expand as the woman's pregnancy went further and further into her term and thus was born the maternity dress. And I guess she was smart enough at the then time to patent that idea and is credited with inventing the maternity dress in the 1890s and thus starting the special size market. So she, that, that business ended up taking off and in the turn of the last century, <clears throat> she really fought very hard um, to make this industry a credible one and, and to be actually acknowledged as an industry. I don't know the uh, societal reasons for it, but apparently in the early 1900s and late 1800s, pregnant women after their first trimester weren't meant to be seen in public. And that was the business problem she was attacking. She was trying to make dresses that could expand or not with a woman's pregnancy so that they could be, quote, covered and have it be, quote, unquote, slenderizing fashion so that those women could be seen in public. And um, these are actually two advertisements that she had to fight for three or four years with uh, New York City newspapers to actually be allowed to advertise around that idea because it was such a taboo thing at the time. So that was the problem she was, she was solving and um, her persistence led to great success and it's what adds to a lot of our passion now. These are some of her designs. I just thought I would share them because you guys are design students. You might want to see stuff from 110 years ago. Um, those are her original tea gown dresses, which were really revolutionary at the time. And of course, she, as a, as a working mother that was widowed at the time, um, you know, had a multi-million dollar business before women could vote. 
So it was a really inspiring story that still resonates today with many people that work at our company, many people that shop at our company, and provides us with great inspiration for what we do to try to be the best at what we do, to live up to this kind of legacy. So that's us. I mean, that's, that's how we got to where we are. I mean, we're, we're at a chain of stores now addressing a huge market that's growing very fast. Um, we have a unique concept in that we're a multi-brand, fast fashion, um, chain for, that's focused exclusively on sizes 12 and up. We have a great uh, management team and great opportunities in front of us. That's the end result of that thought process that I outlined about how you get or how you take a concept or an idea that you have and try to run it through several sort of basic academic steps to get to see if it can actually be a credible good idea. These are our, our store locations. are all locally in the area. We have four stores now. We have two more that are opening in the next uh, three or four months. We also are relaunching our internet store. And these are all in malls, which are with all within about 20 to 30 miles outside New York City. We get great feedback from our customers. Obviously, that's an endorsement of any, any, any concept uh, gets its credibility or endorsement from the people it's serving. Um, the, and we, we feel thrilled that we get these testimonials all the time, that we're, we're truly onto something because the customers tell us we are. We get great press, you know, another great endorsement of, of an idea. If you, if you take your idea to fruition, how, how do you know you're successful? How do you know you're credible? It's not always sales. It's not always profitability. Sometimes it's our people writing about you, our customers happy with you. And I guess just recapping kind of some stuff that we've learned, um, I think when you're thinking about your idea and if you actually go forward with it, which I would encourage all of you to do, especially during the times that we're living in. I mean, I, I, Alice and I were talking about it before class. I mean, you know, the days of tons of buying jobs out there, the days of, you know, in-house design teams and things like that are, on the one hand, th those days are behind us, but on the other hand, there's more opportunity now than ever before for new concepts, new design concepts, new retail concepts. Get, they, get, they get funded and, and uh, they get launched all the time and, and many of the bigger retailers, department stores or uh, manufacturers are, 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 are funding them all the time. So there's terrific opportunity for people in your position to take an idea and actually get it off the ground. Uh, and I think if you do go that route, um, an important set of things to, to, to learn, which is kind of my, my constitution is, is up here, which is um, at first I think you need to know what you don't know. I mean, in my case, graduating from, from business school, clearly I didn't know how to run a retail store, and clearly I didn't know how to merchandise to customers. Those were two big holes that I had to fill. So that's, I, I, knew that I, didn't knew, I, I knew that I didn't know that, and I went out and tried to get that. Um, it's very important to be honest with yourself about what you don't know. Uh, a lot of people think that they know everything, and I'm here to tell you that they don't. Um, Another, another thing that is really important, which I think is more true of retail, but it's also true in life, is that you know, the people that you're serving can fire you every day. That's what Sam Walton, I guess, said at Walmart. Uh, in retail, specifically, the customer can fire you every day because they can come into your store and never come back. But as a designer, uh, a buyer can tell you, I don't like anything that you've done. Uh, in business, somebody can take a presentation and tell you, you did it wrong. Uh, the point is, is, is to realize that you're on stage every day, you need to perform every day, and the people that you're serving can tell you you did things wrong every single day, and you have to show up with a great performance every day unless they're never coming back. I think the next thing that um, becomes quite important with a startup idea in particular is to watch your ego. If you're in school for a couple of years refining an idea and thinking of an idea and formulating an idea, you get very passionate about it. But it's important to put that aside when you actually go out to the market or when you actually go talk to people about the idea and they criticize you. Criticism is good. I mean, you, you're only going to get to a realistic place with a concept if you listen to the bad things people tell you. You know, one of the challenges I have as the CEO of our company is to hear the bad news. You know, the bad news is good because you, you, know, you want to actually address the things that are wrong. And, and it's only when you put your ego aside and you truly listen to what people have to say that you're going to get that advice and feedback. So it's important to get your ego in the right place. 
at the same time, uh, be persistent. And those are things that are related, and, 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 and there's a tension there, but a balance everybody needs to strike between listening to people around you, listening to what the market tells you, listening to what customers tell you about modifying, modifying your idea, and knowing when to continue and be persistent with your idea. In my great-grandmother's case, you know, from 1900 to 1905, if she had listened to these newspapers say, you can't advertise your, your concept, um, maybe she wouldn't, you know, maybe her company wouldn't be 800 stores with a billion dollars in sales today. Uh, but it, it, you know, she didn't listen to those people. She, she persisted and got those advertisements done. And as a result, you know, her business flourished. So you have to know when to listen and when to be persistent. A number five is something, I mean, I've presented to other people. I don't think people at FIT need to be reminded that things are about the details. I mean, you guys, this is, I'm sure you're reminded of this in every class that you take. I mean, whether a measurement's off or a design is off or, you know, everything's in the details. And, and, and the, the hardest thing for me to learn as somebody that didn't grow up in retail was that in a 3,000 square foot store with 2,800 units on the floor, if one unit had a strap hanging on the floor, a lay person walking in that store may not see any problem. But when that one strap is on the floor and there's a piece of dust in the back and a fitting room's open when all the others are closed, the sum of those details is bad experience for the customer and the customer leaves. A subliminal psychological thing happens and they say, I don't want to shop here and they leave. So what I learned very fast is even the most mundane details uh, matter, particularly in retail and fashion. And I'm sure you guys know about that much more than I do even. Uh, the next thing I think that's critically important is to love what you're doing. I mean, to bring a great level of passion to it. Um, in my case, uh, sitting in your position really reminded me of that. Being in a program with lots of other smart people equally as focused and passionate about an industry made me realize that unless I really brought a great deal of passion to my own concept, there was going to be other people equally as smart and equally as fired up about this business who are going to be there as well, so I wouldn't necessarily be able to be maximally successful. I think whatever you're doing, you can bet on the fact that there's going to be other people doing it if it's a worthwhile thing to do. And so a lot of times the only difference between you and them is your, your, your enjoyment of it and your ability to become obsessed with it in a healthy way, your ability to be passionate about it, because a lot of times the same people at the same idea are equally as smart, they're equally as experienced. Many of them can come, you know, both from a place like FIT. The differentiator between them will be how much does one person truly love it and, and just run out of bed every day to go to, to, to go to work and go do it versus the other person that might be doing it only because they think it's a good idea versus bringing a level of passion to it. I think it's very important to bring a level of passion to what you do. Um, in a startup in particular, and, and again, with, with my advice and, and encouragement to go forward with these concepts, it's not about getting everything right. <clears throat> you might, um, in, your, in your first year at FIT, you might grab somebody to come collaborate with you on an idea, and you might find out at the end of six months that, that they're not the person that, you, they're not the person that you, you ultimately need or you guys aren't great partners. Um, in a startup, it's more important to just constantly keep moving forward and move the process forward and make, make progress, evolve the concept, that's more important than getting everything right because you'll never get everything right. As you're getting something off the ground, it's impossible to be so precious and thought out with your decision making that you're not going to make mistakes. The important thing is to move fast, keep moving forward, and just fix the things that you get wrong very quickly rather than try to get everything perfect. Um, the, the, the last thing really, this, you know, managing one's stress, it becomes important. I mean, if, you, if you're passionate about something, you love something, you put your name on something, you, you know, you, you bring all the connections that you have into an idea that, you, that, that, that you're trying to get off the ground, there's a massive level of pressure that you'll feel. I mean, people have, have given you their name. Very often, they'll give you investment dollars. They'll, they've given you their reputation. Your reputation's on the line. Make certain that you, you, you deal with that stress because it's within the context of that stress that you have to make very critical and analytical decisions with regard to your company that are going to get clouded by the stress and you're going to make the wrong decisions unless you can put the stress aside, deal with it in some way, and keep your head on straight about simply just the objective decisions that you need to make with regard to business. And then the last thing is, you know, I mean, I'm living proof of this. It's better to be lucky than smart. I mean, in... Uh, 
in, in our case, um, you know, graduating school at the right time when they're funding retail ideas, I mean, that's not a, a credit to anybody's brain power. That's really just being in the right place at the right time. But definitely remember that <clears throat> I think a lot of people refer to luck as where hard work meets opportunity. So you definitely can make your own luck in life, but it is better to be lucky than smart. And that's really it for us. I mean, I, the one thing I would encourage you guys all to do is take down our, our information um, and, and our, our phone number and, and email because as we open our corporate offices, which we're doing over the next month, we're going to be able to accommodate a lot of interns and we're going to need help, a lot, of, a lot of help, particularly as we launch our, our internet business. Uh, any sort of graphic design, internet merchandising, um, social networking help, I mean, any, anything with regard to running an internet retailer, um, with regard to our merchandising operation, uh, we're going to be in the market over the next six to nine months for an assistant merchant or assistant merchants. Uh, any, any stuff around the office uh, of, a, of a retail business and a startup retail business, as my, as my new colleague can attest to, is very much everybody touching uh, everything. So it's not, not necessarily a focused position or, or focused openings that we have as much as we want people that are passionate about our industry, passionate about what we're doing, that, that want to help a company like ours because frankly at a business like ours, like the ones that any of you I hope start, everybody's chief cook and bottle washer and you need to sort of answer anything that comes up in a day. So I, I, I would really love to hear from any of you and I have my own business cards if you guys want to come up afterwards. and, and uh, if you want to come up afterwards and, and, and get my business card. But that's, that's really it I, in terms of my presentation on, on how to take a concept from idea to, to market. And that I, I can't say enough that we're living at a time where I'd encourage you to do that. And I, I think that you guys, if you made it to a program like FIT, any one of you has the talent to, to do that. It's a question of can you take the steps to pull it off. I think you all probably were identified as people that have the raw talent upon your acceptance to this program. I think it's really just a question of how you are going to think about something and try to pursue it and pull it off. So, um, yeah, I was going to, I was just getting to that. Does anybody have questions about us? Hey. Sorry? We actually are, uh, that's, I wonder where did I, did I put that in there? Where, do, where was that? Did I? Well, if it's in there, it's in there. We, we actually do much higher than that now. Um, I guess that slide's an old slide. But we, we have a model where we, our initial markup's very high. Uh, our product's very cheap to our customers and to buy. But that means on a margin basis, there's still great opportunity for us. Uh, that's also part of identifying a great market opportunity and an inconsistency. There's a lot of product out there, and there's not a lot of retailers out there. So the retailers have all the buying power in this case. You know, we're, we, don't, we don't go to showrooms of vendors where we're one of 25 buyers. You know, we're one of five. So they, there's not, a, obviously the bigger market demand there is for a product, the higher the price will be, supply and demand. There's, no, there's a lot of supply in our market, no demand on the retail side. But there is this demand on the customer side, and that's the business problem that we're pursuing. A lot of our vendors are right up the street, 1107 7th Avenue. They have hanging goods. You know, it's not, there's not such a need for us to do that anymore now that we've grown. Um, but I guess the point is, is that in any fast fashion business, it's like H&M gets goods on the floor in seven days. You know, I mean, that's their whole big thing that they promote in terms of their capabilities is they could see something on the runway in July in Paris and knock it off within seven days and have it on their store floor. Um, we, we do a version of that, but not with our own production cycle, but because the vendors that we contact and because of our size today, they all have hanging goods that we can get turned around immediately. And they all have low uh, domestic warehouses. It's not stuff from overseas. A lot of it is. A lot of our stuff is. It's made around the world. I mean, we have over 100 brands. So it's made all over. But there is a lot of stuff made in the continental US now. Hey. It's interesting. Our, you know, the initial concept was 
was to provide brands and branded goods. And for a couple of years when we started, or about a year when we started, we actually um, provided things like Gloria Vanderbilt jeans and Hot Kiss jeans and um, <clears throat> even some of the urban wear type stuff. We found that for our customer base, the brand in and of itself is less relevant than, it, than, than an item being very trendy and appropriate, meaning the current trend that that's in any store, they want to find it in our store. So about nine months ago, our, our, our best-selling jeans were skinny jeans. It wasn't the brand of jean that was the re resident thing with our customer base. It was the fact that that trend, which they were seeing all their friends get, no matter what size, could be had in our store at a great price. Where it fit well, um, it was priced well, and it was trendy. If any of those three things, if any one of those three things are off in any way, our customer doesn't make the purchase. But, it, but it, it's, again, putting our ego aside and living and learning in terms of what the market told us about our concept. Our initial thought was to get all these brands in one spot. But what the customer was telling us was, I don't care so much about the brand as much as I want the hottest, trendiest goods, no matter, you know, size aside. <clears throat> so, you know, I think, I'm trying to think right now what's in our store. There's like a big metallic trend right now that, that's in the fashion world and it's on our store floor right now. You know? Right. Who do you work for? Yeah. Where do you work for that? At, at, in? Gotcha. I ask you because my, my sister works at Nordstrom in the White Plains store. <clears throat> It's funny, um, there's not a black and white answer to that. Our merchandise resonates across many demographics and, and ages and ethnicity, I mean, across all, across all demos, right? Um, because of where our stores are geographically located today, there are certain concentrations, there are certain higher concentrations of constituent customers. But the fashion of our store speaks more to an attitude and it's merchandised more for an attitude rather than it is merchandised around an age or ethnic background or socioeconomic background. So in other words, anybody that's large, that's on the, the 60, the, the biggest misnomer about the large size opportunity is that 60 million women connote one market. I mean, that's probably 10 markets of 6 million people. I mean, that's segmented all different ways. I mean, that's very, dis, I think it's very disrespectful of, of people in general to say, just because these people all have the same size range, that they all have the same preferences and psychology and all that stuff. We speak to the segment of the market that wants fashion forward stuff. So they tend to be people that are totally at peace with their own size. They don't think of themselves as an exception. They really just are, are fashion and fashion forward the way the Missy customer is, the way any customer is. They really just want what's in fashion on their body as it is. Not, they're not looking to hide. They're, and there is the customer that, that actually doesn't want to go shop in a mall, you know, wants to shop in a catalog in the plus size market because they want to hide. There is the customer that, you know, is like maybe 50 plus who m might have wished that our store existed when she was 25, but she's career oriented. And so, you know, 80% of her clothing purchases revolve around suiting and stuff. We don't do that. We're, we're, so we end up with that strategy with a core customer base that ends up being, you know, 20 to 40. And, you know, we, we have certain uh, customer profile characteristics. But it's, they're, they're, they're set as a result of where our stores are geographically located today more than they're set by who we're merchandising for. Because we're actually merchandising across a lot of demos. Like, for example, one of the stores that we have is, um, one of the stores we have is in uh, Livingston, the Livingston Mall in Livingston, New Jersey. It's actually one of the most affluent towns in Livingston, New Jersey, but it happens to have a bus route, a public bus route in New Jersey in the parking lot of the mall that actually is one stop away from Newark, New Jersey. So you actually have like a really affluent and uh, lower income customer shopping right next to each other. And they're shopping right next to each other in our store with the same fashion preferences. Somebody's, buy, you know, somebody's coming in buying $500 at a time while another person's coming in buying $40 at a time. But they're, they, they coexist in our store. 
So it is, yeah, it's, it, it would make somebody in your job, like in your job, it would drive them nuts because there's no. Yeah. Do you do large sizes at Nordstrom? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we exist. I mean, a lot of the department stores, there, anything that they offer for plus sizes will be set by the corporate relationship with that brand. So that if they have a corporate relationship with a Ralph Lauren and the department store decides to own a plus size, there's an obligation to buy, you know, a piece there. And yeah, we think that that's basically asking the merchandise with handcuffs. You know, we want our merchants to basically, or the one merchant that we've got, to basically go out there and say, you know, get anything trendy with no, you know, no, uh, uh, yeah, no, no, with, with, with no um, limitation based on any factor. Just go get what's hot. So, yeah. I think in my, you know, in my case, I was always sort of fascinated with this industry based on my family background. So it was definitely an area that I looked at or kept track of for personal reasons. I tried to put an analytical lens on that from my financial background to say, what's, you know, what are the market dynamics here? Do sort of a formal analysis of how much money is being spent, how many consumers are there, how many retailers are there. The way that I would suggest, I think you have to be passionate about any market. Right? I mean, you can't just decide, you can't just, you know, search on the internet to find, you know, big markets and then say, you know, let's, let's just throw a dart at that and then come up with a concept there. I do think you have to find a marketplace that you can be passionate about. But once you find that, then look at it analytically. And there's many research organizations and trade organizations and the U.S. Depart Census Bureau and all sorts of information readily available on the internet that can start to give you an idea that there are a lot of people a lot, a lot, there's a lot of cons potential consumers for, for this industry. So the, the big thing that was the light bulb in my case was it just didn't make sense to me that there was three national chains for a consumer base that the Census Bureau says has si more than 60 million people. I mean, it, may, it just did, it, you know, I would go to malls and I'd, I'd just go to any mall and, and I'd see, well, you know, my mom, who's like a size six, you know, would, would you know, drag me to 20 stores or something. And then I'd say, well, but wait a minute, there's this other mass market and they've got like two or three stores. Like, that doesn't make any sense. So, the, but, but then I tried to substantiate, all right, well, so those three chains within this market are driving X number of revenue. And then how does that compare to what the industry association says is being spent on the clothes? So those three brands, like in our case, those three brands were driving like three or four billion dollars in sales in a market that the industry trade group was saying is like a $30 billion market. So I was like, well, you know, now that's another inconsistency. If there's $30 billion being spent, you know, where's the other $26 billion being spent? You know, it was being spent fragmented across like department stores, independent stores, mail order, you know, all these other things. And I was like, it just, you know, we need to, there need, probably needs to be another store that, that kills these three stores in the mall. Um, but, but the internet is your best place for industry research. The, in, the, the internet and probably the library at FIT. I think you, you, you can identify a market based on your passion and then you can go get the analytics behind it to see from the Census Bureau how many customers in that area are there, how many customers as defined by whatever I'm, however I'm slicing it with my idea and my concept, can I find some, can I substantiate that with, with an outside source of data, whether it's the Census Bureau. A lot of, um, a lot of the, I guess there's um, independent research organizations like Min Mintel was one of them that we used, M-I-N-T-E-L. And they, they, they're like an objective reporting company that's not linked to any business or bank or anything like that. They just objectively report and sell reports um, on different industries. And actually when I was in grad school, I got one of the classes I was taking to subsidize purchase of that report for work that I was doing. So, talk to a professor here. <laughs> Does anyone else have, have anything?
Any other questions? Well, as in the 18, in, in, I guess in 1899, her home, right. She incorporated in 1899. So it was like, uh, it was, I guess, yeah. Yeah, she, uh, it's 100 and, 110 years ago. Uh, yeah, it's Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street is when the, is they, they, they had the flagship store there with, with the corporate offices and stuff. And then um, it was a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting story. The story of that business is on our website. If any of you are interested, it's, it's a pretty, it, it, I think it speaks to kind of what, what you can do as an individual when faced with any sort of circumstances, if you're persistent enough or if you're passionate enough about what you're, what you're doing. So we don't, yeah, we don't have designers per se in our, in our um, business now. We may at some point. Um, we, a lot of the vendors have their own in-house designers. They have their own um, way of coming up with product. A lot of their product is just based on designs that the industry has, has endorsed as being the trend of the moment, and then they just put it around a spec that's applicable to our market. Um, but it's, there's, there, there are designers, an increasing number of designers have gone into our industry. Uh, both people that are traditional designers, many of you that you know about, both people who have, uh, also people who have just started up themselves as, as startup designers and only wanted to go in this industry, which I, I find actually kind of interesting. The latter is, is a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting situation that we've discovered when we've gotten calls from people that say, hey, I just, you know, I've, I've always been large size. I, I've always had to make my own stuff. I'm now designing a line, and, the, and people have actually gotten somewhere. And it speaks to the fact that, you know, when there's a market opportunity and not a lot being done, if you have persistence, you can get something done. So, yeah. You, are you are you a competitor? Are you taking that? Sound? No, I, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. It sounded like a very specific. I'm just absolutely kidding. We no no no. We we um our I mean our average purchase in our store is like forty forty to fifty dollars, which is two items, and there's not a lot of seasonality to our business. Um, we don't we're not we're not weighted toward the fourth quarter a lot like other businesses are. We're we we actually have a pretty good mix between the fall and spring seasons. And we have a lot of theories as to why that is. But you know, the, other, the other thing to keep in mind is as a young business, it's tough to know if that's going to be the trend that continues as we roll stores out in other, other geographies and other places where other communities are different than you know, the New York community, which is obviously more like Mars than it is to the rest of the country. You know? Yeah, and we've, that's, I mean, we've found a real lack of, you know, a real, there's a, there's a lack of a real contemporary, trendy, you know, trend-driven offering. I mean, our, our stores are next to Forever 21 stores in malls, and we're, we're, we look exactly like them, except that our size range is up. You know, it's a lot of, it's related separates, it's contemporary stuff, it's, not, it's very item-driven, it's not collection-driven, it's... Um, you know, merchandise to the point where we have very high turns and new things all the time. And it's a very, it's, it's probably a way of being a competent retailer in general in today's environment, but it's re it resonates so much in our market because it's our market's a customer base that's not had any stores to go to. You know, I mean, whereas if you're a Forever 21 customer, 
you might be going to Charlotte Roos Forever 21, H&M, New York and Company. I mean, our customers had Lane Bryant. You know, Lane Bryant's one brand. It's one collection. It's, you know, everything's made to go together. Uh, it's, it's not a great uh, example of where the customer's mindset is today. Well, we have an open. We we actually have opened. We've opened sooner. Sooner we we've sooner opened up next to Lane Bryant's than we have Forever 21's to actually open where the customers are. So, and Forever 21, by the way, now has a plus size line called Faith 21, and they've yeah they've gone into the market as well. So again, you know, back to that point of any good idea begs replication. I mean, you better bet that any good idea where there's a great market opportunity, other people are going to want to go after it. So, yeah. We didn't advertise. We tried to get as much press as we possibly could based on our family history so that we could get some attention, which was what we considered free advertising. And um, we, but, but we, part of the reason that we paid a premium in rents to be in malls was so that we could depend on their traffic. And we also tried to co-locate next to any other plus size companies in the industry so that we could um, piggyback on their marketing dollars, because if they were spending to drive customers there, we wanted to splinter into it, so. It's, I can't, just because we have outside investors and we're a private company, but, um, you know, we're growing like a weed. I mean, it's, it's, but it's, again, I don't think it's anything spectacular that we're doing. You know, we're in a market space that's growing at 11% a year with just a few retailers in it, so. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's the, the, the market's there. We just happen to be reacting to it, you know. But, there, but there's a huge amount of competition happening now. I mean, a hu that, I mean, that Forever 21 came into this market, that Lane Bryant changed its store format, that, that uh, Hot Topic launched Torrid, which is a, a, another young, contemporary, much more brand-focused concept. Um, that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of competition in our market now since when, when we started four years ago. And so... While the opportunity that we, while, while the market opportunity that we're in propels some of our success, you know you still have to get better and better because the, you know it's you, the market's not going to propel you forever. So, yeah. I think a little of both. I mean, I don't think that we're going to ever be an advertising-driven business, but I do think we need, you know, any business needs to market to get known. Um, and there's not a lot of these people coming into the market that are necessarily copying us as much as there's an acknowledgement in general that this is a big opportunity for everybody. And we, you know, our, our, I'll go back to that slide I had about being unique. You know, we think that the store experience that we provide for people is a, pa a level of passion and, and a, a level of service that they're not going to get anywhere. Now, in any fashion or retail business, unless you have the right product, you're dead. But assuming that you have the right product, you know, layered on top of that, you can bring a level of passion that resonates with customers so that you stand out to them in ways that, that other companies won't. So we focus more of our efforts on, on that kind of an internal culture and company building so that when we have 30 stores, the person in, you know, Virginia is getting that same level of passion as the person in New York City whose store I visited, you know? I mean, it, that's the challenge. That, we see that as more of a challenge than can we hire an advertising company that helps us get a right message, you know? Yeah. Uh, we are, yeah, I mean, we're, we do. I mean, it's not, the lease isn't done. But yeah, we'll open up a store in Manhattan. I mean, this store, we have, one of the stores is in Green Acres Malls, like in just on the outskirts of Queens. And another one that we're opening in uh, December, January is actually in the Bronx. So those will formally be stores within the five boroughs. But Manhattan is, you know, hopefully not, not too long thereafter. So did somebody, uh, was somebody's hand raised over? Yeah, sorry. Sorry? Are we, do we, are we going, going to? Yeah, I hope so. No, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great point. And that's kind of why we located not in New York City, but in, 
you know, the suburban New Jersey, greater metro area, is to prove exactly what you're saying to the investment community that our stores in, in the outer or greater metro area were uh, more indicative of what would happen in other states and across the country rather than you know, a store in New York City which doesn't prove that your concept can exist in other places because New York City is so unique. You know, there's not a lot of other places like it. Um, but, but the way that we'll do it is really just executing in terms of our field organization, um, putting in levels of management and, and clustering stores so that we can exist in other places. But the store base that we have now was put in place to try to demonstrate that we, that, that we could exist elsewhere. You know, Livingston, New Jersey, 45 minutes outside of New York City or 35 minutes outside of New York City, the, the theory was it, that, is that a place like that in, a, in a, just a, you know, B mall is indicative of the 700 other B malls in America rather than a store on Madison Avenue, of which, you know, there's no other Madison Avenue in the country. So does that, does that get at what you were asking at? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. I think, I think, and it's one of the big challenges of, of any retailer. I mean, I think that any, any um, retail chain that's in, like, many different communities has to adapt to those communities. And on the one hand, you have to standardize the experience so that somebody traveling different places gets their fashion to figure experience wherever they go. But on the other hand, you have to do whatever it takes locally to develop that audience and that customer base. And it's interesting, it's one thing that Nordstrom does, which is, which is not like the rest of the industry is, they merchandise locally by geography as opposed to by department. So like, yeah, I mean, there's, for, for that exact reason. I mean, Nordstrom basically will have like a Northeast. Right. Sure. Sure. No, but that, but they do that. They do that to try to meet what you were saying. I mean, they do that to try to acknowledge that there are different preferences in other places because most retailers have merchants by department, so that they say, "Here's the top buyers," right? And you know, to your point, like that's not necessarily great because, like. Tops in Florida are not necessarily the same tops you need in New York in November, you know? Yeah. No, it's in, so it's, you know, then that gets to be a decision that any retailer makes, is, you know, how are you going to set up your, your merchandising to, to meet those local preferences. But in a specialty store that's a small size box on a specialty niche, niche audience, I guess the theory, and we'll see if it plays out, but the theory is that because it's a smaller offering in a very focused community of people, the preferences are more alike than they're different based on geography. Whereas a department store, you know, has got 20 different constituents that it's talking to at one time, may truly have differences in each, in each spot. So in our case, like in theory, you know, we hope that the stores can be sta standardized. Any, anyone else? Well, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Yeah, no, I put it down there, so that's why. Hey. Hey, how are you? Yeah. I just think that it's amazing, and I didn't know it existed. I'm so excited to have a store here. And Do you? That too. Yeah, I, I love know that it. I can't yeah. wait to start that. And it was I feel I feel like they were created for you. I mean, they were created for like a younger person that wants to be edgy, you know, fashion forward. It's you know that's what they're that's what they're on the market to do. I definitely would love to help. Yeah.